Um, so I don't have time to zoom in on the algorithms I told you about the precise heuristics to build a fine schedules. So let me just tell you that there are plenty of slides about that. Uh, essentially uh, about objective functions. So that, that's the most interesting thing if you want to learn about this. How you actually build opti optimization problems to figure out the, the right comp composition of tiling, fusion, uh, uh, shifting pipelining, etc. Uh, so many of these problems can be reduced to uh, linear objective functions uh, using this Farkas lemma I mentioned uh, yesterday. Uh, but I don't have time to go into this. The general idea is that you have to capture the dependence constraints. So whatever is correct is, is semantically uh, legal. And all kinds of constraints, modeling resources or uh, communication volumes or th things like this, as long as you manage to cram this information into linear constraints, like defined constraints, and, <coughs> and also some objectives, which will be related to, again, some locality effects. So for example, the distance between the producer and consumer, uh, or trying to um, maximize the number of uh, data that gets coalesced in memory. Uh, so it's like n n uh, essentially in consecutive addresses, and also accessed by consecutive threads on a GPU or uh, within vectors on a CPU. So all kinds of objectives can be formalized also that are um, essentially close to the the, what makes sense on the real hardware in terms of um, performance, but also expressed in a linear way so that you can use this, this, these techniques. Um, I, I, I'll conclude the presentation by, uh, with a representation on some approaches that are not linear, that don't necessarily rely on linear programming and linear objective functions, but the state of the art in polyhedral compilation is to try to cram everything into a linear problem. So again, I don't have time to go into the details, but there are some slides and references. The main papers are these two ones if you want to learn about these techniques. The Fortier scheduler in 92, and then the Pluto algorithm and uh, tool in uh, 2008 uh, from uh, Uday Bondugula. And then there are some more refinements on how to do things in a slightly different way or make it more customizable. A recent paper we had on, um, on um, trying to hybrid a little bit uh, the to, uh, to essentially uh, add some non-linear effects into, um, into linear programming for, for scheduling. So I'm skipping that, so there are all kinds of techniques, interesting cases to consider. Let me just show some performance numbers, so because all of this has to essentially, eventually do something useful. Um, so you may have heard about the polybench suite. So it's a suite of uh, kernels, like small numerical programs um, that have been primarily designed for making the life of uh, polyadol compilers easy. So the contract here is that the code is easy to analyze from a linear, like a fine uh, control flow and, and a memory access point of view. Uh, uh, some other people have actually used it for completely different purposes, just because it was numerical, simple, and there. For example, WebAssembly, the first publicly available benchmarks on WebAssembly was using Polybench for absolutely no good scientific reason, but I guess engineering-wise it made sense. <coughs> that was fun when we noticed that. Um, but essentially, these are linear algebra benchmarks, um, uh, simula uh, simulations like finite uh, different methods in, in physics, um, statistical measurements, solvers like factorization, LU, Gram Schmidt, etc., and some stencils, which would be similar to convolutional uh, layers in neural networks or image processing, etc. So you have some kind of a uh, little zoo of numerical kernels that are amenable to polyhedral compilation. And the, those results are on CPUs. Uh, I think the machine has uh, 10 cores. Yes, it's a um, 10-core, uh, reasonably recent Intel CPU. Um, and these are log-scale results. So you can get uh, huge benefits. I'm not going to compare the, <coughs> the, the, the three variants that are discussed here, but you can get like more than 100x performance benefits uh, compared with uh, <coughs> compiling with ICC, so Intel's um, compiler. Uh, with automatic vectorization turn on, automatic parallelization turn on. So the most aggressive, let's say, general purpose compiler available in production today, you can get still 100x performance improvements uh, compared to that, which is a bit crazy. Uh, and this is essentially due to what I was telling you at the beginning. So um, the, 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 the complexity of the memory hierarchy and um, um, uh, the, the, the different degrees of parallelism, etc. General purpose compilers have a hard time to figure this out. Um, they, there may be some libraries that are highly optimized, but in general, you need some more aggressive techniques uh, compared to what's available in, in compilers. Um, and then, okay, there are, there, there are many more things to say about this picture, but I will have to go into the previous slides to actually discuss that. Um, th one more thing, um, many of these results rely on some auto-tuning, uh, also known as iterative feedback directed optimization. Um, basically, taking actual measurements of the performance 
um, to drive some heuristics. So the heuristics are not only black box. Some of the decisions, some of the parameters uh, depend on some like feedback directed um, runs. So you actually run the code, measure performance, try different parameters like turning uh, on and off some, comp some compiler switches. Or in this case, it's mostly about finding the right tile size. It's surprisingly difficult to figure out the right blocks when decomposing matrix product on a, even a, a simple CPU. And that actually results into complex auto-tuning auto -tuning spaces. Just one thing. So if you look at this graph, uh, the, this is comparing the, the state-of-the-art heuristic to guess the right tile size uh, with respect to what auto-tuning gives you on top. And this heuristic is actually pretty good because everything in blue means that these are different configurations that are worse than the heuristic to guess the tile sizes. And everything in red compares, uh, uh, is, is related to improvements you can get uh, through auto-tuning. So depending on the benchmark, it, you, may, you may actually need it or not. Yes? Just to be sure, uh, auto-tuning is uh, runtime adjustments or uh, you run it you get it? No, it's compile time. Okay. Yeah, it's compile time, but you recompile many times before you uh, converge on the right parameters. And this is what is here on the, on the y-axis. The number of times you actually have to do it. Um, so it depends on the heuristics. Can be random search, can be genetic algorithms, can be some reinforcement learning technique to try to navigate through the, the space in a smarter way. But yeah, it's feedback directed. That's but offline, sorry. Yeah. So there are some refinements to this. Let me completely skip that. I don't have time. Uh, references, I promised that at the beginning. So two sets of references, aside from what I listed before. So this is more like general results in Pressburger arithmetic applied to uh, compilation, uh, including some papers I already mentioned. And these are more subjective references from what I believe is the most important if you care about the fine scheduling. So uh, answering a question uh, of yesterday, there is no like textbook on polydol compilers yet, at least, but I think it's getting more and more uh, important and also maybe more and more feasible given the maturity of the techniques. Uh, but at least if you care about scheduling, this is where you find the, the most references and, and algorithms. Uh, now. I want to focus the lecture of today on how we actually make use of this to solve real problems, not only publish papers and uh, have fun, but also have fun in solving problems of others, okay? Not the, the, the problems we invented uh, ourselves, because we are very good at that in, in, in academia, obviously, but that's not enough. Uh, so there have been multiple attempts to that. Actually, I, I was one of the um, people pushing for it uh, for the longest time, I guess. Uh, not really the longest time, but maybe the longest time in open source frameworks that have been um, widely available. First time was in Graphite. Uh, it's a project of GCC, which made it into GCC 4.5. So some of you were not born yet. So you were born, but not academically. Um, uh, and it was a, a prototype to essentially apply the Pluto algorithm this, uh, into GCC, uh, recognizing loop nests into this polydor, like linear of affine forms. And, and uh, doing something very simple, but at least demonstrating you could do it on a low-level intermediate representation in a production compiler, etc. So that was a pretty big effort with lots of collaboration. Initially, it was mostly AMD, and then some of the people from IBM also uh, were involved. Uh, we didn't use the ISL library initially. We used the um, Parma polyhedral library, which was designed nearby in Parma. Um, and then we switched to ISL later on. Uh, and this project also forked into other projects, including the LLVM poly framework, which is much more uh, well known today. But none of these are really used in practice. So if you compile stuff with GCC today, you may use uh, graphite without knowing, but probably does nothing. Uh, if you compile with LLVM, unless you build it explicitly with a poly project, it's not there. Okay? So it's still not adopted by um, the LLVM project for all kinds of technical and non-technical results uh, r reasons. Um, but still, we had lots of effort towards that, this direction. We had lots of funding as well from industry, from ARM mostly, but also later from Xilinx and Facebook. Um, and I uh, will report on some of the work we did with Facebook uh, in the next slides. Uh, and this resulted in research projects, prototypes of pretty good quality. If you look at Pluto, this is a very robust uh, tool, um, and PPCG as well for, for GPUs. Uh, but these are nowhere usable by normal people. So you cannot just uh, CMake and just run this thing. So that's, that's a failure, I would say. Despite all this work, all these collaborations with great people, uh, we are still not there yet. And the first papers on polyhedral compilation date from the mid-80s or even the mid-70s if you go back to Lamport's uh, paper. So we have a problem there. So we got funding, as I said. We got a found kind of foundation called Polylabs to coordinate the efforts and to fund some of the developments, not only research, also development, community efforts, including uh, training, tutorials, etc. No book yet, but that would be the typical um, context in which uh, we could do that. <coughs> uh, so, yeah, look at polylabs.org if you want more information. I'm not sure the, web is, the website is up to date. 
uh, but this is a community mostly managed by Tobias Grosser now at uh, ETH in uh, Zurich. Uh, so Tobias Grosser was the um, uh, designer of the Poly framework, uh, if you know him, and uh, uh, one of the a key LLVM developer as well. Uh, so all of this started, just a bit of history, uh, in case you're interested in how academic research goes into production or doesn't go into production. Uh, it started in 2008 uh, when ISL uh, essentially was built. Initially it was a, 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 an LGPL pro uh, project, uh, which is, uh, at that time I was rather, let's say, uh, strict on uh, open source definitions and policies, and uh, I would support the FSF very strongly, etc. Then uh, we realized that if you want to be pragmatic and have an impact, especially in the embedded, uh, embedded systems world, or if you want to talk to Apple or all kinds of companies, Qualcomm, etc., there is no way you can do that with uh, GPL or LGPL. So we talked with ARM, we had some different discussions in the context of a European research project um, that was called CARP, that was very successful. That's in this context that actually we started the PPCG project as well for, for GPU uh, parallelization. And we just decided to switch everything to MIT license um, or Apache. I mean, it's very uh, uh, <coughs> relaxed uh, licensing schemes. Uh, and now everybody uses it without telling us, but that's fine. So and if, you, if you're looking for a library to do any kind of polydol-like work, I strongly recommend to use ISL right now. It's a very robust system, it's tested, it's used in many projects. It's very rich in terms of algorithms, but it's very low-level engineering. So it's plain C, the API is very low-level, you have to manage lots of memory issues, and like, type, the type system is crazy. Um, some, of the, yeah, some of the interface is really dated, although it's not an old project. But it's there, it works, it's, it has very few bugs, so right now there, there, there's nothing else to recommend, basically. So we had these collaborations I mentioned with ARM, with Qualcomm, etc. And one project I want to zoom in is uh, what we did with Facebook in 2017 uh, until the beginning, until the, the, yeah, last year basically at the same time, uh, trying to adapt those techniques to the context of uh, machine learning, like deep learning especially, and it's, uh, essentially switch from um, HPC, like high performance computing dominated applications towards um, machine learning and uh, mostly convolutional, convolutional neural networks. Uh, the reason we did that was that, okay, there was money, there was support, there was interest, uh, but mostly there were people actually willing to help. So there some engineers in fa at Facebook willing to get involved, uh, do heavy engineering in terms of coupling source-to-source uh, -source prototypes with, um, uh, with the deep learning frameworks, PyTorch and CAFE in this case. Um, and this is something that we could not have done in academia alone. So we didn't, didn't have, even with the support of the Polylabs and ARM, for example, we didn't have the enough uh, engineering resources to do that. So we had people willing to do it, let's do it, let's try it for real. And that, the, the, the project was born, it was called Tensor Comprehensions um, early on. It was open sourced um, early 2018. Um, one of the goals was to make it part of PyTorch 1.0, uh, which was released a few months later, but for many reasons, including some of the main contributors leaving, uh, didn't happen. Uh, so the, 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 the leader of the project at Facebook is, uh, was Nicolas Vassila, Vassilake, uh, but he's now at Google, so that, that, part, that part of explains why it died out. Uh, it was a collaboration also with uh, Zurich and uh, MIT. Uh, so why machine learning, essentially? Uh, everybody does machine learning today, but the, the, there has to be some like, scientific and technical reason. The main reason is that although deep learning and especially convolutional ne neural networks are very popular, have gave r rise of uh, very f like, complex and rich frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, etc., uh, and mathematical libraries to do the math, to do the computation, uh, there is a problem here. Is when you deal with like ResNet or ImageNet or like simple, well, not, not that simple, but well-established neural networks, you're fine. So the frameworks are heavily optimized for it, the, the math libraries are heavily optimized for it, but it's not necessarily enough. There is more to, to, to deep learning than what, what was done in the late 90s or what was revived for GPUs in the, in the early 2010. So essentially the frameworks are very rich, there are lots of libraries from hardware vendors like Nvidia, Intel, etc. Lots of higher level interfaces for building networks, training them, uh, doing automatic differentiation, etc. I won't give you a course on, on deep learning. All this is, works very well, but you get good performance only when essentially you fit within what the hardware vendors or what the highly optimized numerical libraries provide. If you start using more fancy layers, they are called custom operations in PyTorch or TensorFlow, uh, you are on your own. You have to op optimize those ops. Uh, 
uh, if you want to optimize across multiple layers, for example, across a convolution layer and um, uh, some activation function like Redu, uh, you have to fuse those explicitly, or you have to you have to do all kinds of speci uh, like domain-specific tricks that may or may not be implemented in the in the frameworks. So, if you, essentially, the 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 the, 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 the picture is is very much uh, bipolar. So, either you fit within what Intel and NVIDIA. Uh, or Google, some of the um, uh, like people writing numerical libraries provide, or your own, your own. Okay. And you can go very quickly from like very close to the peak performance of the GPU or some accelerator or some CPU to hot orders of magnitude slower than what you would expect, uh, and also very inefficient in terms of energy, etc. So when you build the bill for the for the cloud in the end, or when you have an embedded system, it's just unacceptable. If you do research, it might be fine, but that's not sufficient in general. Uh, and in general, we are left with this challenge, which is every time you figure out a new network architecture, uh, like new model, um, uh, you try to do it, to do machine learning research, for example, you think of uh, new ways of uh, parallelizing the, the, the models better or parallelizing the layers better, you're on your own. You have to do it manually. You have to write CUDA code, etc. cetera. Uh, and then that becomes a bottleneck, which is very crazy. So it, it slows down research. And maybe you have great ideas, but your great ideas will be 10 times slower than what uh, NVIDIA engineers have, uh, have done. And in that sense, machine learning application, like deep learning, is different from scientific computing, from the benchmarks I mentioned before, like the, the, the polybench. Uh, because the, the, the variety of the problems is, is, uh, is, is maybe like, it's much, it's, much, it's much wider. So you have many more uh, operations to deal with, many more hardware um, uh, accelerators, not only GPUs and CPU from Intel. Um, the data layouts and types of the numerical computations are also quite diverse. Uh, so when you are doing scientific computing, I mentioned that yesterday, it's essentially raw major um, uh, linear algebra. Uh, in image processing, uh, it's a little bit more diverse, uh, but uh, like in graphics, I don't know if you know about shader languages, etc. Um, but if in machine learning, it's completely, cr it's, it's very crazy. You can have like seven-dimensional computations uh, playing with uh, transpositions of the data layouts in many ways. Of course, the library doesn't provide all the implementations; they only provide a few layouts. Uh, but in general, you would like to play with many of these of these combina combinations, and the data types can range from one bit to 64 bit. So you also need lots of symbolic manipulation, mostly for high-level algebraic or al algorithmic optimizations, like converting uh, forward passes into uh, backward differentiated um, uh, operations. So that's part of the backpropagation or stochastic gradient descent of uh, neural networks. You want this to be automatic. So you want the neural uh, network ops or operations to be described in a like, symbolically uh, manageable language, not only just numerical uh, operations. And also the programmers are mostly like Python programmers. They don't have a clue about how to write CUDA code, uh, which is fine. I mean, they should not. Um, so the general idea is to make it completely transparent. So there are other ideas. But what we wanted to do with tensor comprehensions is just hide all the complexity and make everything automatic. Okay. Everything from mathematics, like just writing tensor operations, essentially tensor, so-called tensor contractions. I don't have to give you a course on um, tensor algebra here. I'm not also a, an expert in uh, like uh, general relativity or something. But it's a very simple language that lets you do multiplications and sums uh, and max and all kinds of reductions on um, uh, like associative and commutative operations on uh, matrices and higher dimensional, uh, higher order uh, <coughs> tensors. So think of matrices in 3D, 4D, 5D, etc. Okay, and from that, I'll show the language in the next slide. Uh, from that language, you want to automate the algorithmic space, uh, like finding automatically the, the backward differentiation of operators or doing some simplifications. Uh, so we don't do anything new there. We just use existing packages. You want to map uh, the computation uh, to a GPU or CPU. Uh, so we use polyhedral techniques for that. And you want to specialize all the parameters. So in, in machine learning, they are called hyperparameters. For example, the sizes of the, the shapes of the tensors. Uh, the shape of the layers. Um, if you know that a uh, layer has a very precise numerical size, it's better than remaining parametric. It makes many of the optimizations, uh, like generating the control flow and uh, array indexes, um, uh, much more efficient. Uh, so all of this is uh, automatic. Um, so the, 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 our joke is that we provide a new op or new hope uh, for machine learning and applications. Okay, but if you got the joke. Uh, the, the main non-scientific part of the work was actually to make it transparent. So not only automatic, but actually transparent. So if you're using PyTorch uh, or Cafe2, which is now the like, heavily optimized um, backend of PyTorch, you just 
use Python to compose layers, as you've learned uh, uh, at school, and uh, it gets optimized transparently, especially if you write new layers that were not part of the libraries. You get, the, the, you get um, tensor comprehensions, if you use it, obviously, to, to, to trigger automatically. So there is some prior work. I'm going to uh, skip that. But essentially, if you're interested in related work, it's close to a language called Latte from uh, uh, Intel that didn't make it to production. And also some domain-specific construction um, um, methodologies called active libraries or build to order. You may find some papers on that if you're interested. Uh, so this is a very high-level uh, infrastructure view. You have the tensor comprehension language that I will describe in the next slides. Uh, it gets translated into the halide language or intermediate representation that I talked about yesterday. Essentially, the, um, the computational, like the, de the denotations of halide, not the schedules of halide. The schedules, we will use polyhedral techniques to build them. But the denotations, which functions get computations, uh, computed, this is, we are using halide uh, IR for that. And then we convert it into our own polyhedral uh, uh, intermediate representations. We use ISL for it. We loop on this several, several times. We apply multiple <coughs> scheduling algorithms. And we go down to generating CUDA uh, loop nests and, and, and kernels. Okay. So there are also alternating, uh, alternative paths. You can uh, generate uh, stubs for bundling with PyTorch. So there is a um, uh, um, um, tensor um, uh, like API uh, from PyTorch called ETAN, which means a tensor library or something. Um, <coughs> which is, so the stubs are generated also automatically, and you can link it with frameworks that way. <coughs> and there is a project at MIT to use LLVM and maybe Poly as well. So lower level like vectorization and enhancing techniques. Uh, like silk type of task level concurrency <coughs> in this context, but I don't know where it, where it is right now. Um, uh, so this is uh, this is this is research. Okay. So the main track I'm talking about is the vertical line here. So this is how <coughs> tensor comprehensions look like in one slide. Uh, let's say that you want to optimize this kind of matrix vector computation. So this is the syntax. So you take a matrix, which is a tensor of two dimensions, uh, order two of size m and k, you take a vector of size k, these are parameters, these are symbolic constants, and it generates, uh, it computes a vector c of unknown shape. So actually you don't even know it's a vector at this point. Okay. Uh, oh, here, when you look at the code inside, you know it's a vector because it's indexed in one dimension only. Um, you know it's uh, the result of one like functional <coughs> definition, so just one equation, that's, that happens to be reduction, so it accumulates, it does a, an associative and commutative sum of uh, several products, and all, all these products happen to be um, just the vector computation, the, 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 the matrix vector uh, computation for, uh, of A and X. So from this uh, statement, the, sem the semantics of the language lets you automatically infer that C is order one, so it's just a vector, and the size of C is the same as the, um, the first dimension of A, because it's indexed in the same um, space, so you're using the same index I. So we have this kind of shape inference mechanism, it's a very simple type system, uh, that will just say that, oh, C is actually of uh, uh, a vector type and uh, size M. Okay? And the semantics of this operation is functional, it just takes all the right-hand side and realizes that K is only used at the right-hand side, not on the left-hand side, meaning that it's going to be accumulated along K. So the, the reduction is over K and not over I. I is used both on the right and left hand side. It's used to define all the elements of the C output. But K is a reduction dimension, so it's going to go away, to be eliminated in, through this sum uh, operation, which is associative and commutative. And the bang symbol here is just to say that C is initially considered uh, the neutral element of the reduction, meaning zero for the, for the addition. So this notation is actually inspired from the so-called Einstein notation of tensor uh, contractions which has been in, in use for more than a century. And um, it's used in some other frameworks, like the so-called Einsum primitive of, um, uh, of uh, TensorFlow or NumPy, etc. So if you've done some machine learning, you've, you might have encountered this notation before. We just make it the primitive notation in the language to write code. You don't have to write any declarations of types or sizes or anything, except the element types, which have to be floats. And you can write more interesting examples like this. <coughs> uh, that in this case, it's essentially a, a convolution of uh, 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 it's three layers of convolution. Sorry, so you can see this as the fusion of three convolution layers in a neural network. Uh, this is a convolution. You recognize H plus K H W plus K W. So these are like two D stencils, like the examples I showed yesterday. These are the kernel weights. 
um, uh, then you apply a, a point-wise uh, uh, max uh, operations, which is just this ReLU point-wise activation function uh, popular in, 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 in convolutional uh, layers. And you do it three times. Okay. Uh, so notice that the left-hand side, again, the shape is automatically inferred. We don't know what O1, O2, and O3 are from the definition of the, of the, um, of the function. Uh, and in this case, it's a little bit trickier to analyze because the bounds have to be inferred from more complex expressions. So you have H plus KH, uh, for example, which will depend on both the, uh, the layer size, which is... Uh, the, sorry, the input tensor, which is I, and also the kernels. Um, uh, I think this is a typo. Actually, this should be KH, capital KH, capital KW. These are the, um, the kernels. Uh, so you have essentially an input tensor, and you have to shrink it a little bit, if you remember the code of yesterday, so that the kernels will not ov uh, overflow on the boundaries of the, of the inputs because of the sum here, the convolution. So all these translations get done automatically. You don't have to think uh, what should be the exact size of the output. This is the language supports it. And be behind the scenes, there will be polyhedral compilation going on, so tiling will come into play. The fact that the tiles may not perfectly interact, uh, in intersect the boundaries of the tensors is also taken care of automatically. You don't have to think of all this stuff. If you do it by hand, it's a nightmare. You have to, it's very easy to, to, to make off by one errors. So you just write code and you forget some iterations. It's incorrect. You take ages, it takes ages to test and understand what's going on. So this is all uh, completely automated. Uh, so again, the variables that are only on the right-hand side are reduction variables. Okay. They, this is implicitly s accumulated, summed over all values of kh and kw. And one last aspect, it doesn't look functional like this, looks like side effects, but it is really functional semantics. You have to read this as, let's define O1 as atomically the sum of all this stuff, all these uh, terms. This gives you a, a functional, like, opaque uh, tensor value. And let's define another variable that happens to be a tensor, also called O1, but it's a fresh variable here, actually, uh, uh, from uh, applying the Fmax operator to the, um, uh, to the previous tensor, and zero. Okay, so although we reuse the variables here, these are actually fresh tensors every time. So th th there is no way you can write cycles. It's forbidden in the language. It's, uh, it's checked. You cannot have like inductive definitions or hidden side effects this way. Uh, these are just, the fact you reuse the names is simply for convenience. Uh, okay, I should not work on the cable. Any questions for this language? There are many things I cannot uh, talk about, but that's the, that's the basics. So we can write more interesting examples. <coughs> uh, for example, uh, this one-liner took three months for NVIDIA engineers to optimize. So that's a paper uh, for, from NIPS, I don't remember, like 2016 or something, called Group Convolution, uh, that essentially takes the typical convolution operations, like H plus KH, H, uh, W plus KW, but, but operates it in groups. And the group dimension here uh, makes it much easier to partition, so to parallelize the convolution, uh, without having overlapping regions uh, due to the, um, uh, the stencil operations. So it's much easier to parallelize, for example, on distributed systems or on GPUs because you don't have communications across, uh, across tiles. Uh, so that gives you much better scalability and efficiency. Uh, at the expense of some information flow is lost in terms of, um, uh, like, the, the, when you do the training, some backward propagation doesn't go where you want it to go. But machine learning people do some magic to recover that by essentially adding more layers and doing more tricks in the, in the training. And it dramatically improves the... Uh, GPU efficiency why, without uh, reducing the, the accuracy of the, um, uh, of the predictions. So you can look at the paper. So it took three months for NVIDIA to write an optimized version of this. And when we compared actually our work, when we started tensor comprehensions and when the next generation of the Kublas library or QDNA library came out, NVIDIA magically caught up with what we were able to do. So when publishing the paper, it was too late. Uh, we just told the story. This is the whole point. We don't want an engineer to spend three months doing something that can be automated. And in the end, they were essentially getting the same performance as we did, a little better, because they do it by hand. Um, but, okay, we didn't have to wait for that to happen. You could just take the paper formula, write it, it's almost LaTeX there, and get the numbers. Okay, that, that was the whole story we wanted to come up with. And it was a success. Um, and then another thing you can notice is you can write um, the same algorithms in many different ways. So that's the kind of algorithmic optimization I was referring to, although here it's, uh, it's, it's modeled by hand. Uh, 
So this is called the Kronecker recurrent units. I don't want to go into the math. It's actually a very interesting uh, research area in machine learning. Uh, but this happens to be, it's not obvious here, but it happens to be a seven-dimensional computation. Uh, so you have a four-dimensional output plus three dimensions of reduction. So all the, the indexes that have underscore R here are actually reduction operations and added the, with this op. Uh, so this, this is implicitly seven nested loops that are captured by this um, op. Uh, and there are essentially three ways to do it depending on how much intermediate storage you want to have. So the first version doesn't store anything uh, in terms of temporary storage. It just computes everything again and again and again. And if you look closer, you realize that many of the products here can actually be memoized. Many of the products are uh, the same. Uh, they, are, they are redundant across um, values of the, of the output. And you can make this redundancy uh, go away. You, you can memoize explicitly by uh, materializing intermediate tensors that do partial products. So the product, the product of the input x with one of the weights, for example, call it, call it x w2, and you can reuse it in the next operation. This reduces the number of nested loops by one dimension. So not, now you only have six dimensions instead of, of seven, uh, which means the computation has, is faster by one order of magnitude, but you use, one, you use more memory. Okay? So this is doing more use less work compared to, to that. Same thing, you can do it twice. You can go down to five nested loops only. Notice that there is only one reduction dimension now per uh, equation, but using two tensors of intermediate storage. So whether one is beneficial compared to the others is not obvious. Uh, sometimes it's better to do redundant computation because you may not have enough local storage, for example, on a GPU, or the caches may limit what you can parallelize uh, efficient, efficiently. So it may be better in some cases to recompute rather than store the intermediate results. And what's better depends on the problem and the sizes, the, the, the parameters, etc. Another reason to do auto-tuning, because sometimes it's very hard to actually predict what's, uh, what's best. So in this case, I'm not telling we have a heuristic to decide what's best, but by just writing a few lines of code, you can explore the, sort of the, the optimization space uh, very easily. And this is something that researchers do all the time uh, to get good, uh, good results. So I, I can zoom in and explain more in detail, but um, there is a paper, so that's reference. You, you, can, you can see the full story. And you can write more interesting examples that actually do real things. For example, a multi-layer per perception from Facebook that's used for image classification uh, that uh, essentially fits on one page. So it's very simple convolution, uh, con convolutions. And uh, one thing it uses, so it concatenates multiple tensors. So it doesn't have to be a straight line. You can have a DAG of layers and concatenate it later. And everything can be fused in one, um, uh, so in this case, four functions, but let's say one tensor comprehension program. And we also programmed uh, later on the um, WaveNet. Uh, um, uh, so this is actually a cell of a recurrent network uh, from Google. That's the network that was used for speech synthesis uh, in, the, in the duplex application. So in, the, in this rather controversial demonstration where you could make a restaurant reservation without uh, uh, interacting with um, human beings. Or at least there was one human being at the, the other end, maybe, but the, the, people, the, the people doing the reservations were WaveNets. No, that was only for the speech synthesis, of course, not the full thing. So that, that's interesting. So we can write real things, not only individual layers. We can actually write whole subgraphs of uh, machine learning models using this, this language. Although it's a very simple language, you can do many things. Uh, and the alternative would be to write this. So this is intentionally unreadable. So this is CUDA code. This is performance uh, metrics you get from the NVIDIA tools for performance evaluation. This is low-level assembly. Uh, I think this is ARM assembly. Oh, no, this is actually a PTX, yeah. Uh, forgot. But okay, we don't want to look at this. Okay, that's completely hidden. So how does it work? I don't have to tell you. I already tell you. I told you it's, we are using polyadol techniques. The main idea is to convert these problems into linear optimization problems. I've already said that uh, yesterday. Uh, but we are adding a few a few techniques to make it uh, more um, uh, uh, like better tuned to machine learning applications. Uh, and uh, one of these techniques is related with this schedule trees I mentioned yesterday. Uh, so here I'm trying to explain, the slide is trying to explain a few of the um, details of the schedule tree uh, abstract syntax. I don't have time to go into it, but essentially we can attach some semantics to regions of the um, iteration domains or regions of the schedules that are specific to GPU computing or specific to the tensor comprehension uh, semantics. So whether it's a reduction, for example, or a parallel loop, this is important. How to model reductions in the polyadol framework is not trivial. There are, there are some methods to do it, but it's not very well established yet. So we are providing some help to, uh, to convey this information here. I don't have time to go into detail. 
so in the end, it's a lot of engineering effort. It's not so much new like scientific methods. The algorithms are essentially the ones that we developed uh, uh, earlier in ISL and used in the Pluto source-to-source uh, -source compiler or, or PPCG. In this case, we started from PPCG. Uh, but it's wrapped into a machine learning framework in a transparent way and essentially with some engineering, with some like redesign of the full stack, you could get um, uh, uh, like rather obscure research tools usable in the context of machine learning uh, uh, um, uh, acceleration by completely non-expert people. So it's not completely uh, true. There are some scientific improvements. For example, we added the s some heuristics in the scheduler to uh, essentially to scale better. So a clustering technique, uh, a clustering technique that's used for um, operating not at the level of indi individual statements, individual instructions of the tensor comprehensions, but groups of statements that would be closely related. Uh, so there are some essentially uh, heuristics that will favor uh, accesses that are similar in, uh, in dimension, in, uh, in locality, patterns. Th these are typical things you may want to do, but okay, you have to do for real if you want the, the, the linear program to scale to larger uh, programs. And also memory promotion, which is the most important thing if you're dealing with, um, with GPUs. You want to make sure that uh, accesses are explicitly uh, happening in local memories. So it's called shared memory in, 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 the, in the NVIDIA devices, uh, meaning that there is no cache, or the caches are very inefficient, so you have to do all these data transfers explicitly. And the heuristics for doing that uh, before tensor comprehensions were not very well tuned to machine learning uh, uh, algorithms, so we had to essentially improve those heuristics and decide when it's valuable to promote uh, me main memory accesses into shared memory. Even if you have tiled the things properly, you still have to decide what's profitable to, um, to promote and try to pack things efficiently inside the shared memories. So it's a little, like, a little bit like register allocation, but at the, the granularity of uh, tiles in, in, in tensors. Um, and uh, also generalizing, generalizing those ideas to non-affined non subscripts. So you could have for example, uh, tensors that are subscripted by some index plus an opaque value, so an, a value that comes from another index. This is very standard in so-called embeddings in machine learning. So you may want to uh, capture um, r data of variable size into histograms of uh, histogram tensors of fixed size, essentially because you want to compare the, 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 the distributions across multiple inputs that may not have always the same encoding and size. And people use embeddings for that. These embeddings are histograms, so they use these interaction arrays, interaction tensors. So this is not a fine, and we need some tricks to approximate these values, uh, these, sorry, these uh, symbolic expressions into, um, into linear forms. That's something we had to do there. So it's not very new. But it was never done in this context, and some, some new algorithmic work was to be done there. So just one way to encourage you to do this kind of research. You may, want, you may think that your tools are essentially doing the job, but when you look into the details, oh, there are a few tricks we have to, to do, and scientifically it's raising some more interesting results as well. In general, in scientific research, that's how things work. If you don't look at practice you, or at some other domains, uh, you may never think about some interesting problems. So that was an occasion to do it and to demonstrate it again. And finally, uh, there is some auto-tuning going on, as I told you, that you cannot really live without it. In this case, we have a form of uh, CPUs to compile many tensor comprehensions in parallel. Uh, so essentially, this is happening on a single node, so it's just cores of, the, of a single machine. Uh, and you run uh, actual executions of the generated CUDA kernels on multiple GPUs. So Facebook had pretty large machines at that time with uh, eight state-of-the-art GPUs on the same node. Uh, and lots of memory. So we could run lots of batches of compilation jobs and profiling jobs in parallel and uh, search using a rather brute force genetic algorithm. The, 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 the genetic algorithm doesn't have many interesting features there. It's just accelerating a little bit the cross-pollination of, uh, of good parameterized uh, um, tiling solutions and like, uh, optimization knobs across the, the, the populations. But it's essentially working because the machine is big and we could run lots of... Uh, profiling jobs in parallel. Okay. It's just that without auto-tuning, you don't get anywhere right now. Uh, some of the parameters, we just don't have a good profitability heuristic to figure out. And these are the results we got. Um, so this is a bit old now because all these libraries from uh, NVIDIA have bumped at least uh, two versions since then. Uh, but it gives you an idea of what to expect. So um, <coughs> the, let's look at those two first. 
This is transpose matrix multiplication, and this is transpose batched matrix multiplication. So it's essentially a bunch of matrix multiplications run in parallel. Um, and we are comparing, um, so higher is better. We are comparing the native performance of the Kublas library. So this is the linear algebra library provided by uh, NVIDIA. All the Kublas wrapped with this ETAN um, uh, stub for PyTorch integration gives uh, more or less the same performance. And the last two bars correspond to what we do. Uh, so the first one is uh, using only the default heuristics, and the green one is using auto-tuning. Uh, in some cases, auto-tuning was worse. I forgot why, but I think this is essentially uh, uh, noise. Um, <coughs> the group convolution, so the, 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 trans the transpose matrix multiplication doesn't result in uh, much uh, performance benefits. The, the main reason we actually have improved performance compared to Kublas was that we selected a rather odd size for the, um, for the kernels. So it's not printed, printed there. I should actually add it to the slide. But the, um, the size of the matrices, the size of the tensors matter very much because the libraries cannot cover every possible size. So here we get some benefits from specialization, essentially. So the, the generated code is faster because it, it does less like stupid arithmetic or control flow. And it also specializes to sizes that NVIDIA did not think were really relevant, let's say, uh, in practice. But they were relevant in, in, uh, in, in some actual models, just that the library could not cover every possible case. Um, the, the batch case was even more interesting, uh, uh, relevant because of that, because we could get more parallelism, if I remember well. And this group convolution is the story I told you about. So that was before NVIDIA actually bumped their library with the new algorithm group convolution optimized for, for CUDA. So we could get huge speed ups compared to compared to it. But then they, they, they essentially caught up. And the, the, the leftmost examples, they show that on full applications, like a multi-layer perception with um, like a few dozens of, um, of, uh, uh, of layers, you could get benefits as well. So it's not just for kernels. For full models as well, you could get some performance benefits and not negligible, like up to, up to three. That's for one of the cells, and this is for the full uh, MLP, up to uh, three times faster on the um, on a state-of-the-art GPU at, uh, two years ago. Okay, so it's not, it's not hopeless. Full automation works. If you want more information, you can look at the paper. We can, you can look at the code. It still runs, I think. It's a little bit painful to install, uh, but it, it should work. The problem is that it's not maintained anymore. Uh, but if you have questions, there is a mailing list as well. There is a blog, blog post. There are some, yeah, some discussions you can figure out. At that time, it, was, it got lots of attention, but now, obviously, it's not maintained anymore. So. so <coughs> How much time do I have? Okay. Uh, no. 40 minutes? minutes. Okay. Uh, <coughs> this, ex this experiment was, uh, was, I think, successful in the sense that it raised the attention of many people. But still, just like the experiments before, it didn't really make it to production. Okay. It, it's integrated with production tools, but it's, nobody uses tensor comprehensions today apart for writing a few papers. So, yeah, people did compare our numbers with other frameworks. So. People managed to use it, but not for solving real problems, just for publishing more papers. Uh, so, okay, let's try once again, because <laughs> at some point we want to succeed. We really want to make polynomial compilation useful. And the, the good news was that Google got interested in this work, in the tensor comprehensions work, and we got into discussions um, like early last year, and essentially decided to join Google together uh, about, about six months ago to try to use this, all this experience and, um, and essentially starting from scratch in terms of tool construction, implementation, but use this experience in the context of a new project uh, started by Google, which got open source recently that probably you heard about, called uh, MLIR. I don't know if you've been in touch with the LLVM community, you probably heard about it. So it was presented last month uh, at the Euro LLVM uh, uh, conference, like developer conference in Brussels. Uh, so I'm just going to select a few slides to give you a little bit of the big picture of this project. So it's a compiler construction project that is primarily <coughs> motivated by machine learning, uh, trying to bridge different representation form <coughs> for models and um, uh, retarget um, compilation to different uh, uh, hardware accelerators. Uh, so it goes way beyond the scope of polydoral compilation. It does many, many things. And at some point, it may also become uh, an LLVM replacement for like, high performance computing or more abstract optimizations. I'm not going to cover all these things. I'm just giving you the, the motivations and showing you where polydoral ideas fit in this context. If you want more information, there is the tutorial, there is the um, keynote, there is the code, there are discussions, etc. <coughs> so it starts from the context of the TensorFlow framework for machine learning, 
So very similar to PyTorch that was used in the previous <coughs> framework, except it's, let's say, much more mature in terms of industry deployment, while uh, PyTorch is a more researchy uh, uh, system, mostly because it lacks the ability to generate good code for embedded systems, uh, quantized learning, etc. cetera. Uh, so I <coughs> don't, don't want to, to tell you more. Same story as tensor comprehensions. Why do you need actually a new infrastructure for compiling uh, anything or even why do you need any new systems efforts in this area in terms of research or engineering? And the story is more or less the same as uh, what I told you before. So the, there is lots of diversity, but it's even worse if you step back, if you not only consider TensorFlow and machine learning, but you actually consider multiple languages, uh, higher level languages, uh, domain specific languages, uh, and, and r try to think what's the good representation for this, not only uh, in terms of loop nests and arrays and tensors, but actually stepping back and looking at compilation for these higher level languages. And <coughs> currently, this is how LLVM is used by most people. So you have uh, C++ or C as input or some dialects uh, going into some high level ASTs that essentially implement the C++ semantics, which is hard enough, but do don't do any like sensible optimizations except for uh, instantiating C++ efficiently. Then go to LLVM IR where, where most of the classical uh, like textbook optimization takes place. Uh, using the static single assignment and, and control flow graphs. How many of you know what static si single assignment is? Uh, maybe I should, oh, okay, most everyone. So essentially, it's a, it's a, I, I will show you some examples later, but it's, it's a canonical way of representing the data flow among scalar uh, variables in a, um, in a low-level representation. I mean, now at least it's used for low-level representations. So you, you, you don't have to remember uh, uh, an explicit graph of uh, which uh, operations are defining values and which operations are using values. You can capture that as a program in an efficient way. And it's a way to essentially see an imperative program as a functional, uh, in a functional style, so uh, with only definitions, no, no side effects on, on scalar variables, which is very good for optimizations as well. Uh, so LLVM is well established, but it doesn't do much in terms of abstraction. It only deals with SSC graphs on scalar variables, essentially. As soon as, soon as you have arrays or more domain-specific constructs or C++ templates or anything, nothing. Okay? It's, it's all mangled at this point. There is nothing to be done. Uh, and then the backend itself is a problem. So as soon as you deal with instruction-specific uh, tricks, like built-ins to propagate the carry or discover overflows or I don't know what, uh, or the specific types of the machine, you're left on your arm, the LLVM IR doesn't really help you, and there are many backends in LLVM that essentially duplicate the, the same stuff, but on different targets. Um, still, the, the, sorry, still the, the merit of LLVM is that you can do progressive lowering. So you can actually, step by step, more like the Unix uh, Swiss army knife of, of uh, common line tools, you can say, oh, I want to deal with this problem, I want to analyze that property, I want to transform it incrementally, and lower the code from the high-level syntax down to machine by just progressive refinement. So this is a very big success compared to uh, like older compiler designs. Um, but that's not sufficient. So if you bring in more diverse semantics, like Java, uh, the people at Azul, I don't know if you know this company, but they, they have been essentially the ones doing hotspot originally. And uh, <coughs> uh, so ClickClick was one of the main uh, hackers uh, capable of doing both Java, uh, uh, computer hardware, and like com actual compiler construction. Uh, uh, so the, 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 the team were able to cram lots of uh, Java semantics into LLVM IR, but at the expense of completely crazy tricks. Uh, so using intrinsics or built-ins, using metadata, um, using some like uh, domain-specific constructs hidden into programming rules, etc. And they had to, uh, they could reuse some of the LLVM infrastructure, but at a huge expense in terms of uh, uh, cognitive overhead, uh, I would say. Uh, so I'm not familiar actually with the details, but. Just, but I, I've tried to do similar things in other contexts. And indeed, LLVM IR is not meant to be extensible in the way of supporting Java uh, or Java bytecode efficiently. And this is worse because there are many more languages. Okay? Swift, Rust, Julia, etc. All these languages compile to LLVM eventually. Uh, and <coughs> in this case, what, the people, what, what, the, what these people did is that they, they defined their own IRs. So as was mentioned yesterday, uh, Rust has this <coughs> MIR, which is higher level than uh, LLVM IR for Rust analysis and optimization purposes. Uh, so if you want to do uh, uh, borrow checking, you want to do it on something that's more amenable to Rust uh, uh, semantics, not LLVM IR, and many other reasons for that. Uh, so there is a lot of effort to duplicate kind of classical analysis and optimizations at a higher level. Each time you come up with a new language and you reuse LLVM, but you only factor in very little uh, work. 
So the motivation for the MLAR project is essentially, let's try to bring all of this, and actually many more things, because there are also tons of flow graphs. There are also uh, back-end rela uh, related uh, aspects, so generating uh, instructions for accelerators, like GPUs, TPUs, etc. You want to bring all of this in the same framework. So all of this, and also some of the machine IR, you want it to be one intermediate representation that's extensible enough, but uh, still retains the ability to commonalize multiple uh, analyses and algorithms. Essentially, that everything that remains uh, SSA-based uh, in terms of semantics should be um, captured in, in one IR. That's the, the, <coughs> that's the, that's the idea. So you, you want to avoid duplication, and you want to reuse stuff ac across different reuse code and abstractions across different layers of abstraction. So can we do that? For example, one typical example, can we use <coughs> SSA to represent uh, machine learning graphs, machine learning models? And uh, uh, can you cram uh, machine learning model like domain-specific optimizations into SSA-based optimizations. Does it make sense? So intuitively, there is some relation because most of these things are data flow graphs of some sort. Uh, <coughs> but still, somebody has to do it for real. And one big difference with LLVM is that everything here operates on tensors or arrays. It's not like scalar elements. They are not opaque. It's exactly what I was telling you yesterday. Properties are like element-wise or they operate on individual instances of statements in uh, array computations, or uh, in, in loop nest, essentially. So you cannot just only look at, at scalar value, uh, use dev chains uh, anymore if you want to optimize efficiently for um, like doing tiling on the GPU, for example. So great, so let's try to do that. Uh, in in, uh, in, uh, in domain-specific world, people have tried to explore these ideas. So essentially, uh, capture high-level domain-specific optimizations in a more general uh, framework. Uh, progressive lowering is a great benefit, but if you look at what people did in practice, it's like re-implementing all the same stuff all the time. Um, and, and I'm not talking of, talking of the more engineering aspects of the problem. It's not only scientific here, it's like just debugging, providing feedback for like uh, EDIs, uh, if, you, if, you, if you code in uh, Xcode or Emacs, uh, I don't know. Uh, you want some like error reporting, typing, etc. That, that, that works at the level of the of the, the development environment. This is a huge effort you don't want to replicate for every uh, domain-specific language. So DSLs are great, but if you cannot like, commonalize efforts across uh, different DSLs for all these kind of things, it's just too much work. It, it will be nice papers and publications, but not necessarily usable across communities. So very short description of what MLIR is. Uh, so it's essentially LLVM based in the sense of SSA and control flow. Uh, and low-level code, meaning, sorry, low-level uh, linearized uh, uh, code structure, meaning it's not uh, an, ab an abstract syntax tree. It's a, lin it's a linear, linearized uh, intermediate representation, or so-called uh, free address. Uh, every operation is also typed, uh, so that means you have, uh, you have operations, you have instructions that, that are completely documented in, in, in terms of, um, like, as functions, essentially, that have inputs and outputs. Everything is typed. Uh, so if you have a language that has lots of implicit uh, uh, typing capabilities and in type inference, etc., at that level, all the type system, uh, all, all the types have to be resolved, uh, which is very convenient because you can deal with low-level instantiations of, of these uh, instructions and express, for example, gradually the fact that you want to specialize some types to be, um, uh, some generic types, some polymorphic types to be more specifically implemented in a certain way. So you have all these trade-offs of doing things statically or dynamically typically by just typing the, 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 the instructions. But the core is that you want to remain um, grounded in SSA, so it's, a, it's like functional semantics of, of scalar variables within the scope of one function. Okay, that's, that's the main idea of SSA, you want, you want to retain that. Um, <coughs> the, the, the new parts are that now you have much more structure at the level of the um, scalar variables themselves, and, uh, and um, within this linear structure you can actually nest some closures. So the closures we call regions, uh, and, uh, or they, actually it's the next slide. So essentially you can have blocks that co contain functions themselves, but they remain uh, uh, scoped within one function, so that you cannot just uh, have uh, closures that escape uh, the, the, the function where the, they, they, they were defined uh, freely. You, you, you retain a function uh, a scoping um, uh, rule, uh, and, and you can have operations that are, sorry, that are uh, completely custom designed. So all these, we don't call them instructions, everything is, everything is customizable. So you can just define uh, a, a function call to be an operation, um, a, a machine instruction to be an operation, I'll give some examples later, everything uh, can be 
can be captured. Uh, and also, just like LLVM, it's, um, it's round-tripable in textual form. So you can print it out and import it again in a, in a binary format. Uh, so the type system, I don't want to go into the details, but when I said scalars before, actually the types can also be not that scalar looking. So they can be vectors, they can be full tensors, uh, so they, they are essentially um, scalars in the sense of SSA. So they are being defined atomically as one object and used atomically as one object. <coughs> but internally, they may have structure. And then you can actually dig that structure out by indexing the tensors or indexing the vectors, etc. But the, the, the SSA properties are maintained at the level of the full opaque uh, object. And you have lots of type for that, um, including more machine learning specific uh, types. Um, so the, the key, unlike LLVM, is that everything as I alluded to, everything is customizable, except for SSA and CFG and the linearity of the, um, of the representation. Everything is customizable. Okay? So there is no like, specific instructions or there is no uh, inequality between like, standard instructions and built-ins or intrinsics that would be dialect-specific or target-specific. Everything can be defined depending on which uh, domain you, you want, which compiler uh, instantiation you want, which language you want to support, uh, etc. Uh, the, the example here is, for example, why, why is the addition and instruction in LLVM, but add with overflow detection is an intrinsic. So it's some function that's hidden inside the uh, compiler intrinsic. You want this to be completely definable by the language or by the target uh, uh, processor. Um, and <coughs> so this is how it looks. Uh, okay, let me just maybe zoom in on some of the pro uh, uh, properties. Um, <coughs> the, okay, this is more interesting. What I mean by customizable is that you can mix and match multiple levels of abstractions in the same uh, representation and even in the same function. So you, in a given MLIR function, you can have LLVM code, just an LLVM add operation with two operands typed, but also some, uh, let's say, uh, tensor level operation. In this sense, it's a, an operation from the XLA uh, compiler for uh, compiling tensor flow graphs at, at Google, which takes a representation for an abstract representation for arrays called a memref in the MLIR, and uh, you can type it precisely if you want. You can say this is an array of this size, multidimensional, etc. You can attach all kinds of attributes. I don't want to go into the details, but these are attributes defined by the XLA compiler. So you can represent that explicitly at uh, the same level of uh, uh, syntactic scope as the LLVMIR, but at a much higher level of abstraction because now you're not dealing with individual elements anymore, but with the full, uh, the, the full uh, tensor. And you can go all the way up to some opaque tensor flow objects, which could be defined somewhere in Python or some other library. And again, the, like, the full convolutional layer, for example, can be captured as, um, as a tensor flow uh, operation, as an MLIR operation, sorry. Uh, as long as, again, you, you, you reason in terms of uh, scalar data flow. So the tensors should, should be represented in SSA as if they were opaque scalar variables. And again, you can attach all kinds of information like um, internal representation of the, stance of the tensor, what kind of dense encoding of the layouts you, you picked. Uh, okay, all kinds of things that are, that are tensor flow specific. Uh, so one question at this point is, especially if you have been used to design compile, uh, and implement compilers in the past, is how can you do that without breaking all semantics, basically? How can you capture things as different as a machine level add and a TensorFlow uh, like layer um, without completely breaking in, uh, into like uh, stringly typed, uh, just essentially XML, JSON type uh, IR? So it's very easy to say, okay, this is XML, this is JSON, and it doesn't have any semantics, and that's fine, I can represent everything. Okay, so that's not what we are doing, but there is a real risk, and that's the main risk we are trying to avoid. So uh, the main reason it's not uh, uh, JSON is that we have a modular way of describing the core properties of the, of the operation. So whenever we bring in new operations, new types, new abstractions, they come into what we call dialects. So dialects are uh, a little bit like traits. There is a trait system in MLI as well, but they're a little bit like traits for IR modules. So you can say, I want to define an operation that behaves like a scalar operation on uh, like arithmetic or that behaves like a function, or that behaves like uh, a tensor algebra, or whatever, and th there, are, there are, or control flow, or whatever, and, and, and there are ways to define those properties in a cross-dialect way. So you can reuse across different um, <coughs> uh, languages you want to support, uh, etc. And so I don't have time to go into the details, I can only show some syntax, but <coughs> this is how you define a new operation in a new dialect in the most general way as of last month, because it's also changing all the time. 
<coughs> okay, so essentially, unlike LLVM or some other like, more classical intermediate representations, there is a lot of stuff you can say and you have to say about an operation. So whenever you define a new instruction or a new type, the dialect has to provide all these definitions for you. And it, it's, it's much more bloated than you would uh, expect if you're doing simple things for simple language or simple target. But that's, that's the, the, the cost you have to pay if you want to remain semantically well-defined and not just syntax, okay? And uh, so in this case, you have to define, uh, uh, I think, the, yeah, I don't want to go into the, the, the details of everything, but uh, essentially you have some namespaces that are dialect specific uh, and every dialect can introduce a type system, can introduce um, a, a different list of operations, different list of attributes. Uh, you can explain how to track the line numbers or uh, all kinds of debugging or profiling information across uh, operations and across lowering stages in the dialects as well. And this comes with some code. It's not just syntax, it's not just grammar. There is some code in the dialect that provides the semantics to all these things. It's like a completely custom ca type system may be implemented in the, di in the dialect, and you have to provide the rules for it uh, in, in terms of C++ code, basically, to provide semantics to these things. So I don't have time to obviously give you an example, and I'm also not competent on every aspect of MLIR, but just to give you an, a, a, a hint on where it's going. Let's go into more, uh, like, closer again to what we were saying from the beginning of this lecture, so trying to go back to pull it all at some point. Uh, one thing you can do, which is very important for abstracting um, uh, like numerical computations or domain-specific computations in MLIR, is that you can use these regions and you can nest these regions um, in, uh, in uh, MLIR in ways that I've not seen uh, in any other uh, intermediate representation before. So the trick here is that the IR remains linear, so you don't have to think in terms of ASTs, of complex expressions. You can al analyze everything at a single level, just like as a sequence of instructions in the block or br blocks branching into each other in a control flow structure. And some of these instructions in the blocks, so we call them operations for that purpose, they are not plain instructions. They are actually full regions of code which are really closures captured within the function. And the, 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 these closures let you define anything you want. So they can be functions of any type. Uh, can be defined in another uh, dialect, etc. And uh, they can, for example, some operations, like here, the tensorflow if operation, this is actually some kind of um, control flow primitive that will let the, um, the, the, the runtime system of tensorflow distribute the computation across different branches of a machine learning module. Um, so tensorflow has multiple ways of operating. One more data flow style, this is the more control flow style of, of describing models. Um, so the, the semantics of the code inside the TF if is completely custom. It's completely defined by the TensorFlow dialect in this case. So it, it, it's completely hidden from the, for example here, it's, the, uh, from the, it's completely hidden from the scope of the function where the if operation occurs. It's completely opaque at this point. It's just linear uh, IR. It's just an instruction in the, in the block. But if you zoom in, you can analyze the, the, the code with, as another SSA graph, as another um, dialect of MLIR with its own semantics and uh, type system and capabilities, etc. The only thing that ret you retain is the it's still an SSA graph. It's still based on the same way of defining dialects, types, etc., etc. But you don't have to zoom in the operations if you don't care about the, of doing it. For example, if you implement constant propagation or register allocation or anything, you can do it without zooming into the actual semantics of the TensorFlow. If this can be delayed to another pass that knows about TensorFlow, if or any specific um, semantics of it. Hopefully you can also reuse, but essentially they are abstracted uh, in an opaque way. Um, <coughs> this, this is where polyedral compilation comes into play. Uh, if you're familiar with um, poly or like essentially loop nest optimization in classical compilers, one of the most painful uh, difficulties is that you have to recover some programmer, um, uh, some information that the program programmer has that was crammed into C or Fortran or C++ in a, or Julia or whatever in a, in a very cumbersome way. Okay? For example, the fact that the loop nests are only using uh, affine uh, bounds, that the array subscripts are also affine, all these properties, they are not explicit in C. Okay? There is nothing, there is no contract in C or C++ that will force you to use vectors in a certain way that's uh, amenable to put it all optimization. You can do just this with what I, uh, just, you can do this with what I just explained. You can just define a dialect, that's in, in this case it's called a fine dialect, no surprise, to capture exactly the contract you want to implement loop nests that are amenable to polyedral compilation. So you don't have to come up with your own benchmark suite, just come up with your own language, 
like domain-specific language embedded into MLIR as a compiler-friendly, I mean, polydor-friendly uh, dialect uh, where all the techniques I told you about can, like, by construction, apply. Okay? So there's nothing magic here in terms of algorithms or semantics. It's just a nice way to represent uh, turn source of arbitrary uh, rank and uh, accesses that are fine in a, in a way that by definition, you cannot write anything else. Sorry, by construction, you cannot write anything else in this dialect. So this is actually a simplified form of the dialect because you could write um, affine functions, affine maps, to reconfigure the indexing in arbitrary ways. Uh, but just for the sake of making the syntax compact, we use only the, the, the loop counters directly in these uh, subscripts. You could imagine there are affine functions here, actually. Uh, one important thing is that these uh, indexes of arrays A, B, C, etc., these are not plain SSA values. They are not just dynamic values that are floating around. These are actually typed as indexes, uh, as dimensions they are called here. Same thing for the symbolic parameters. They are not just plain invariants in a, in a um, data flow graph or control flow graph. They are typed specifically as symbolic constants for uh, the, the sake of polydoral transformation. So you, you have a type system that, that's there to make sure that you're not mixing dynamic values with like statically affine, uh, um, like friendlier uh, semantics that the polydoral framework wants to manage. So that's something that, from the start, the, 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 designer of, uh, the, the designers of the affine dialect thought about. Uh, we were not there yet. Actually, mostly Uday Bondugula who did that um, last summer. Um, but that's, that's one of the things you can do in MLIR that, that you absolutely have no chance to do in LLVMIR or any other compiler framework I'm aware of. Uh, okay, so if you want to know more, you can look at the tutorial that was presented in April. Essentially, the tutorial tries to define a toy language which is specialized for linear algebra and explain how to lower it into different uh, steps towards LLVMIR and then to compile it on the x86. And this is all implemented through dialects. Uh, so there is a dialect for the toy language itself. Uh, the <coughs> there is a di dialect for uh, the language-specific optimizations. In this case, um, trying to find the right layout combinations for tensors, fusing tensor layers, styling tensors, uh, tensor operations, etc. But all in the dialect itself, so it looks very much like uh, Helide uh, or TVM. Uh, and then there is lowering to LLVMIR, but everything, although it's called LLVMIR, it's still within a dialect of MLIR. So it's still the same um, basic uh, requirements, but you have this trait basically that defines all the instructions you need and all the types that LLVM needs. Okay. So this is tutorial material, so it's not very stable. The code is open source, but it's still governed by Google. It's not completely like community driven yet, at least. Uh, but at least it gives you an idea of where it's going, and you can give feedback, you can try to, to play with it, etc. So it's a large project. I don't have time to explain everything that's going on there, but much of the work in this context is not uh, polyhedral. I'm just zooming in on one of the aspects that make it very interesting for us. But we believe that some of the, um, like the key Domain-specific um, optimizations for machine learning, at least for machine learning graphs, uh, and uh, the key optimizations for high-performance computing as well, we can actually factor in into a rather like MLIR-specific polyhedral framework that we are building right now. So it's not necessarily uh, easy to do that, but we believe we have the right design points to, to make it uh, much more production-friendly than previous designs we were working on. Okay, and uh, we are also hiring still, just in case. Uh, so there are a few projects I didn't talk about. Um, some people are working on um, making MLIR more friendly to um, higher level languages. For example, uh, making first class uh, um, uh, operations uh, of, uh, 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 so, sorry, uh, domain specific language constructs more directly manageable in MLIR. Think of, um, again, LMS, uh, lightweight modular staging. If you want to do multi-stage programming, you want to manipulate code expressions in the IR you, uh, itself, you may want to support this as a primitive construct. Um, so this, you're, we are looking for actually interested people to help on, on, that, on that side. Uh, also, the IR is not completely stable, so it can change, uh, can be broken in, in many ways and improved. Uh, type systems as well, uh, for tensors like sparse representations, uh, novel fancy floating point representations or whatever. Also, type systems that are popular in, machine, in uh, functional languages like uh, GADTs or uh, the Haskell type system or anything. Why not encoding it there? And obviously, the Rust uh, borrow checking uh, semantics would be nice. Um, so I don't know if uh, the MIR should be converted to MLIR, but why not? Um, so there are, there are scientific problems to be explored, but I'm not hiding that these are mostly engineering problems in, 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 in real. It's, it's just that it's, it's, it's valuable, we believe, to, to pay this price of 
recasting some existing techniques in the context of MLIR because it will make it much more reusable in the future, much more um, robust as well because it can be used across communities, something you cannot do with uh, typical DSLs uh, today. Um, concurrency, uh, for example, if you're familiar with uh, concurrency in TensorFlow graphs or uh, the, the eager and the lazy modes of, uh, of, of TensorFlow, you, you probably realize that it's completely broken and complicated. So these, these are things we may want to improve in, in this context, etc., etc. So a lot of research that is happening or could be happening if we had more people, even if we have already lots of people. Okay. Um, so one of the goals is to accelerate innovation in compiler construction but also on the hardware side and the applications. But because as I think I explained before with tensor comprehensions, machine learning researchers right now, they are really limited in what they can write in terms of new models because they don't have the performance for all the new ideas they, they come up with. So whenever they come up with something new, it's just sluggish compared to whatever NVIDIA or Intel provides. So we believe that this kind of framework can really help. Same thing for the hardware side. Hardware people come up with great machines, but they are just impossible to program. This is not new. Uh, they don't have time to think of software before hardware in general. So Probably again, uh, we are not going to solve that decade, uh, like many decade old problem in, a, in just one new IR, but we believe that this is going in the right direction. Uh, so one project I didn't talk about at all is how to get away from this integer linear programming uh, approach that is used all over polyadol compilation. Uh, and um, so it, I told you it's and be complete in general, told you the cost models, the objective functions are not necessarily faithful to the, the hardware. They're not necessarily very close to what the hardware really does. And also the hardware is changing all the time. Uh, so the applications are changing all the time. So basically we are, we are well aware that although linear programming is a great tool because it like, transparently handles all kinds of problems in the polyadol framework, it may not necessarily be uh, the best way of actually solving like, pro like uh, performance uh, problems for, for real. Um, so people use auto-tuning. That's fine, but that's not the, 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 the only story there. We want probably to find better ways of developing heuristics within the, the, the ideas that make polyadol compilation uh, uh, like general and, and, and productive for compiler construction, but not necessarily using linear techniques only. So TensorP Comprehensions was using linear techniques plus auto-tuning in a rather smart uh, uh, combination, essentially pushing to auto-tuning only the parameters that you could not solve using linear uh, techniques. But there is another project I would like to talk about, but really I don't have time, unfortunately. Uh, so that's the work, uh, for example, of Basile, who is uh, sitting here, and a few other uh, students, and a former student who is now at Google. Uh, so I only have the slides for it, and the references for papers, but I don't think we have time to go into, into it. I just want to explain the, the basic uh, the idea, how we can actually get rid of integer linear programming, but still, and actually optimize things even better, but, uh, but, but still get uh, most of the benefits of, of um, polydual or polydual like techniques. So the context for this work is, is called super optimization. So maybe you heard uh, about it in the, in the context of basic blocks, like finding the best combination of register allocation, instruction selection, instruction scheduling for a given processor. So it's very target specific in general. And this is not uh, based on like pass-based compilations. It's not trying to locally improve some uh, abstract view of the machine. It's really trying to figure out uh, upstream what's the best way of synthesizing a sequence of instructions that does a certain, uh, that, that, that computes a certain function. Okay? So you have a space of uh, instruction combinations, essentially, and you want to find the best basic block in terms of performance or code size or whatever uh, objective to implement that function. So we essentially reuse that, that notion, but at the level of loop nests over arrays or tensors. Uh, and that was not done uh, before. And it's difficult. Why is that? Well, you can imagine that uh, it's difficult for basic blocks with instruction selection and register allocation already. But it's worse for, um, for loop nests because many optimizations cannot just compose nicely. Uh, for example, unless you have uh, used some temporary buffers of sufficient size, you cannot distribute computations across different loops. So you have to store some temporary results somewhere. And this is, uh, this is a decision, I mean, this, these are two decisions that are tightly coupled. Uh, so the ordering of transformations matters, uh, just like pass ordering matters, etc. And also the worst thing really is that we have no clue what the machine really does. Okay? So it's, it's, it's very difficult, even on the GPU that has no real cache or anything, it's very difficult to predict what's the um, impact of some optimizations on the, um, on the performance, both because the, both because the hardware is complicated, but also because you don't know what's coming up next. Okay? Downstream optimizations also come into play. Uh, so 
it's very frustrating. I don't want to end the course on this, but people working on optimizing compilation for years have been frustrated all the, all the time that they come up with great results, new papers that say, oh, we solved the, the problem in a narrow space. And then, uh, in fact, it was very narrow, or new hardware comes in, or new problems come in, and you're back to square one, or even worse. Okay, so it seems like we are actually doing worse every year. Okay. So if you're optimizing JavaScript, it's fine, because you're always optimizing on the previous uh, very low baseline, okay? uh, very slow dynamic, uh, like, uh, uh, essentially, interpretation uh, techniques. At some point, it's very hard to go beyond what we got already, obviously. But the baseline is so low that you can do lots of things. If you start from a new DSL, same thing. You can do everything from scratch, and life is nice at the beginning. But then you get into diminishing returns. If you look at like, legacy uh, code written in the 70s or something, it's a complete nightmare. Uh, okay, so it's, it's, it's very frustrating if you work in the field for some time to see that the same like, performance portability problems are there, or even worse than before. Still, one way to kind of get away from this frustrating uh, uh, state of the things is to completely break out of the way of compi compilers are, are, are working in terms of like pass management, ordering, etc., and just go for this super optimization approach. Um, so that won't scale. That's typically something that works at a very local scale, just one basic block, or in this case, one loop nest. But there is hope that this can do things that compilers will never be able to do in general. And the main reason uh, it works is that it combines three, uh, it, it splits the problem of finding good perform, uh, like high performing performance code in three independent um, and complementary uh, tracks. One track is how to represent the code in a way that's amenable to um, search. So you want to make sure that optimizations are as commutative as possible, as independent of each other as, 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 as possible. Uh, the, the, the idea is generally to represent in super, optimi in super optimizers is to represent the um, optimizations as a vector, a flat vector of decisions. And this is a little bit like uh, in the polydual framework. The, um, the decisions in polydual framework are just the coefficients of the schedules or the coefficients of the affine transformations. They are flat. Okay? It's not like a sequence of rewriting rules. It's a much nicer space in terms of um, uh, like algebraic properties. Uh, and that means it's easier to search but it may be harder to actually generate code from it. So how do you synthesize code that's imp imperative code that's fast? Now it becomes a, a, a new problem that didn't, you didn't have with more imperative uh, representations. Uh, so essentially a nice way of representing the problems, the programs, is the first uh, track of research. The second track is how to represent the constraints where this representation is not enough. For example, if there are dependencies, obviously, you want to make sure that the semantics is preserved, uh, like the data flow is preserved, etc. Also, some constraints that are more target-specific with the, the, the machine resources have to be modeled. Some of the control structure also, you, in general, you want to generate um, control flow that, that's imperative and fast, so you, there are some nesting structures to be uh, uh, maintained, so kind of contradicts the, vec the flat vector approach. Uh, but not quite, actually, because if you have flattened everything, now you can also express the, const the constraints on these flat vectors in a rather unified way. So there are dependencies in the polyadol framework. In a more general setting, there would be constraints. And that's in this Telemann project, we use constraint programming. And then you have the search track. So now you have this nice search space. You have a bunch of constraints that describe what to do, what to do and not do. Uh, sorry, what to not do, essentially. What, you, what doesn't make sense semantically or what doesn't make sense in terms of uh, hardware. So now you have to search this space. And so ILP was the, 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 the hammer in, in polydual compilation. In this like, super optimization framework, people typically use search heuristics. Uh, they can be guided by feedback of the actual execution, but this is slow because you have to generate code, you have to actually run the code. Or they can be guided by performance models. This is what we do in this case, actually we do both. We have a performance model that's used for predicting the, the, the direction, so what's the best policy, what's the best action to take. For every, um, uh, for every decision in the vector, so whether you should tile the loops or whether you should uh, promote the data into low, uh, shared memory on the GPU or these kind of things. These are all decisions that you have to take guided by some performance model. And we also use the performance model to prune the space. So we can, we can actually analyze uh, bounds uh, that are rather optimistic on performance. So that that's the best performance you could imagine achieving from this particular vector of choices. And the, the, the thing is, and that's, that's a very original aspect of this uh, performance model, is that it's not a performance model of actual code, it's a performance, performance model of partially instantiated code. So you have some decisions that are take, taken. Think of uh, a schedule vector. Some coefficients are set, but some of the coefficients are not decided yet. They are going to be decided in the next steps of the scheduling algorithm. Uh, 
Same thing here. The search may decide to instantiate some coefficients of the vector and leave some of the coefficients open. You still want to guess what the performance will be. And in this case, you want to guess a lower bound on the execution time, for example. So if you can guess right, meaning uh, tight enough, I mean close enough to the, 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 the real execution time, you can cut big parts of the, of the space. So you can essentially realize that, oh, these optimization choices are very bad. Uh, they are going to be worse than something I already tried. So I'm just pruning the space. And this is like typical branch and bound or, or A star algorithms uh, heuristics. Uh, they're not even heuristics in that case. They can be, you can be optimal, actually. You can, you can cut space, uh, parts of the space that are proven, provably uh, less interesting than what you've found uh, already. Okay, so coupling the two is actually a one, uh, not well known, but at least something that people have already done in, in uh, the, the field of reinforcement learning. So in trying to combine constraints and, um, and search using, <coughs> uh, this is called Monte Carlo tree search, for example, has been done before. So we are not completely uh, doing new things in terms of machine learning there, but we are doing, we are doing it for real in, in solving a new problem, which is a, a compilation problem. So I'm out of time. Uh, <coughs> so let me, Skip that. Let me just conclude, because you, you have slides. <laughs> Let me reuse the same picture to conclude on the, 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 the lessons learned, essentially, from um, polyhedral compilation and these ongoing research projects. Uh, <coughs> the reason polyhedral compilation is great uh, is that it's a nice way to expose the search space, so the candidates, the, the programs you want to explore, the different ways of implementing the same program. It's a nice, ways to, a nice way to, exp, exp, um, uh, to expose the constraints, like semantical constraints, hardware constraints, uh, everything you can do or you may want to consider doing on those programs. And it's also a very nice way to state optimization uh, problems in a, in, a, in a unified way. So you don't necessarily have to think in terms of a sequence of passes that refines the, 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 <coughs> the, re refines the performance and gets closer to, to the target one, <coughs> like one step at a time. You may actually solve more ambitious optimization problems <coughs> um, uh, up front. <coughs> so the reason it works is that everything is a fine, essentially. So it's it's simple, logical framework. Everything is decidable. It might be com complex, but it's it's uh, at least it's possible to solve complex problems uh, with um, like state-of-the-art solvers, uh, <coughs> and it's reasonably uh, effective. So as I think I tried to convince you, you can <coughs> you, you, there are actually numerous applications to that framework. <coughs> You can build compilers that solve uh, problems in many fields, including machine learning th these days. Uh, <coughs> and one of the hopes is that it provides reasonable performance portability, meaning that you can write optimizers that will work ac across very different languages and, and um, targets. So I don't have anything more except for everything I skipped. Uh, the slides will be available. Uh, if you have questions, uh, we are interested to discuss. And thank you. All the slides, all the skipped slides will be available. They are mostly there for reference, but yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so, um, I'm curious about the dialects. Can you mix and match several dialects at the same time? Or is there a for you? Yes. <coughs> so that's. We have not demonstrated it in the in a very like general. Um, further con context, for example. So we didn't try to break it I intentionally, but the intention is that it should work. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> how, would you how would you define the combination of multiple subtypes? They won't combine because they will, be, uh, they will be limited to regions, typically. So some of the type system may not be compatible, but they will not be operating at the same, in, the, in the same precise uh, syntactic scope. Why not? That sounds so you can do it as well. So it, it's that, that that, that's part of the fuzzy thing. So if you are within different regions, there is no problem. It's isolated within the same function scope. Uh, but if you start, for example, optimizing across region boundaries, you'll have some issues. In this case, I think in general you need converters or you need to prove that the type systems are compatible in a way or so have some kind of meta type theory that you can use. Uh, in the end, this is all C++ code. So the semantics will be implemented in that code. Uh, if you want it to be safe, uh, I mean robust, you have to also provide the whatever constraints on, on dialect combinations uh, that make sense. So there is no like magic bullet there, but, yeah. but it's, it's programmatic, let's say. You can solve the problem explicitly. Yep. Uh, a lot of languages 
So that's one of the reasons we want uh, Melayot to be, um, to be a multi-stage language as well. Uh, so you want at least code expressions to be representable in the IR, and you may want, to, maybe you are familiar with the ORC, JIT compiler of LLVM, so you can write C code that, that gets lower to LLVM IR transparently through LLVM API. So this kind of stuff we want to have. So it doesn't address all your questions, but at least if your language embedding is based on multi-stage programming, I think it should be possible. Yeah. Yep. Right. So um, you mentioned uh, at one point that core is not built in. So does that mean if I have a somewhat esoteric language that I want to implement using this, I can kind of put in my own kind of core and composition construct? Yep. So it depends how custom it is. If, it's, if it follows the function called trait, uh, then it's just a, it may carry different attributes or some additional properties, but it's still implemented the same way. You don't, basically you don't have to provide any more code. Uh, but if you have like, I don't know, more expressive call semantics or I don't know what you're thinking of, like concurrency or something. Uh, okay, so then you need to provide some ad hoc like You can, yes, but I'm not sure it will fit into the call up a trait then. Maybe it will be another... Uh, yeah. We have not considered that right now, so... Yeah. Anything that doesn't fall into, like, stacks and... Uh, yeah. It's, uh, in yes, yeah. So you may have to do the proper stack, ma stack manipulation underneath, etc. but whether it will fit the actual semantics of the core, I don't know. Okay, so we are out of time, so... Thank you. There are no more questions. <laughs> Thank you.